Yeah, so welcome back to discussion of our uh, National Law School. And I was making the point that uh, last time we noted that the National Law School are uh, uh, those who subscribe to the view that uh, it is not enough to know what the law is, but also uh, you should also be concerned about what the law ought to be. And that means that uh, knowing factually that this is the law is one thing. And uh, as whether the law is, as to whether the law is actually uh, serving a just cause, the law is good and so on is uh, another thing. Yeah, so uh, for example, in Ghana, you take Article 11 of the Let me tell you take Article 11 of the Constitution, as we noted. The sources of law are listed over there. You go to Article 106 of the Constitution, uh, the mode of exercising legislative power. So uh, an argument will be made that if something is being uh, put forward as a law, so far as we can link it to either Article 11 of the Constitution or we can link it as having been made in accordance with Article 106 of the Constitution, that is the law. And everybody uh, should be uh, satisfied uh, with that. Now, natural law school uh, really disagree with that. And that is uh, where the question of what ought to be the law uh, becomes uh, relevant. That is the point that uh, we are trying to make. And for that matter, natural law school, we also noted, uh, hold the view that uh, the, you know, the moral principles which should be reflected in the law is actually uh, universal. That is to say that in every society, in every country, uh, those, those same uh, moral principles which are supposed to actually uh, inform the law are the same. It doesn't matter whether you are in Ghana or you are in Nigeria. And that is why uh, we started with the early school. That is uh, those who were you know, first to actually express ideas, uh, which we now call the natural law school. We started from the, the Greek scholars, if you remember, uh, Plato, Aristotle, Socrates. And then we also talk about the Roman uh, era. We talk about uh, Cicero, and as you remember, uh, Cicero, will, for example, make the point that uh, natural law is said that it will not leave one law at Athens and another law at where at Rome. That is to say that whether you are in Athens or you are in Rome, uh, the law is supposed to be essentially uh, the same. In other words, if you say that the right to life, or if you talk about life is sacred, right? Sanctity of life, and for that matter, at all times, uh, uh, life should be protected, life should be upheld. Then uh, you are saying that wherever you go, that is true. And it's not only where you are probably, let's say in Ghana, before you like that principle uh, to be true. So that is the kind of thing that, uh, uh, the, the natural law uh, uh, thinker, like for example, uh, uh, Cicero was telling us. And maybe before we continue, I'm sure you're following the, the politics in the US, uh, American politics, uh, where they are going to have the midterm election. And the polls indicate that the Republicans are likely to uh, win majority in House of Representatives and also the, the Senate. And what that means is that uh, they are going to control uh, both uh, houses. And if you follow the campaign, you notice that uh, Biden is practically telling voters that, please uh, vote for us. And once you vote for us, uh, we are going to uh, give everyone the right of uh, abortion. I don't know if you are following that. 
And that brings back the question of, let's say like life. Uh, when does uh, life you know, begin? If you hold the view that once you have like the fetus in the womb, uh, that is life, then a natural lawyer or natural you know, law thinker will say that, uh, then that life should be respected and at, at all times. And not only when it's convenient for you, not only when you want, let's say that the voters to, to vote for you before you actually uh, you know, say that you allow them to uh, have, you know, to decide when to have uh, an abortion and so on and so forth. So these are uh, some of the ideas uh, which we uh, have considered. And again, we also came to the Christian era. Uh, I think that we, we discuss uh, even uh, up to uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, and we made the point that uh, St. Thomas Aquinas uh, sought to bridge the gap, which before him uh, seemed to have existed as far as natural law thinking is concerned. And what do we mean by that? Uh, we made the point that uh, before you know, Aquinas, if we are talking about natural law, the impression has been out there that either you talk about natural law in terms of uh, using the reason, like that you can use your reason to know uh, what the principle of natural laws are, or some will say that you cannot talk about natural law without uh, thinking about God and that God as the source and origin of natural law. Now, so the same natural law, as you notice, uh, have been conceived in two uh, separate ways. Some people looking at it from uh, you know, the reason, others looking at it from uh, you know, God. Now, Aquinas came onto the scene and said that no, the two are not mutually exclusive. It's not really the case that you talk about natural law from the point of view of uh, using your reason, and then you cannot also talk about natural law in terms of God. No, he said that that is a mistake which uh, people uh, make. And for that matter, the two can actually uh, be integrated. And that is why uh, Aquinas in his Summa Theologica actually uh, came out with four kinds of law, if you remember. And we talk about the fact that Aquinas said that, well, we have what you call the uh, eternal law or less eternal, uh, being uh, the law of God for uh, governance, for governance of creation, the created world, everything which is created, uh, God has laws which actually govern them. And then we also talk about what you call like the uh, uh, less divina, that is the, the divine law, that is revelation of God to uh, human beings. And we say that uh, typically uh, we have uh, what you call like the uh, we, we, we have the, the scripture, for example, like, you know, we have like the Bible and in the, in the scriptures on the Bible, uh, God has actually uh, you know, told us uh, certain things and recited the Decalogue and so on uh, as example. Then we also mention uh, uh, natural law itself. Uh, no less or a use a uh, naturalis and the natural law itself and and we said that uh that is the uh participation right participation of uh human beings as a rational beings in the natural law i i, I mean like in the divine uh, what do you call the uh, eternal law that is human beings when we apply our reason to appropriate uh, aspect of the eternal law. That is the law of God, which governs uh, nature. 
when we apply our reason to appropriate that, then uh, that is the natural law within St. Thomas Aquinas' uh, uh, scheme. Then we also made the point that it's not all the time that uh, we can run society, we can run life uh, by the natural law because uh, human beings, we do not have equal capacity at all, at all times to be able to work out uh, what the natural law is. And for that matter, there's a need for human law to so less humana. And then the human law will, for example, come and work out how the natural law, for example, should be applied in specific uh, situations or, or scenarios. So these uh, were some of the things that uh, we said the uh, Aquanans had actually put out there. And then again, we also made uh, the point that Aquanans uh, provided what we call the, the yastic. That's my line of... Uh, Sorry, I think I've come back. Yeah. Then uh, Aquinas also talked about uh, uh, just law. And he said that uh, a, a just law is a law who serves like the, the common good, right? So we attempted to find out within the context of Ghana, for example, when we say like the common good, uh, what does that mean? And this took us to looking at public interest, if you remember, we went into the constitution. We attempted to understand uh, what is called public interest. Because we said that uh, in the constitution, for example, when it comes to, let's say, compulsory acquisition, that is the state compulsorily taking over that would belongs to uh, a, an individual or a private citizen. Uh, the constitution, look at K20, for example, you be told that where the compulsory acquisition is considered as being in the, 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 the public interest, right? Then, uh, so long as adequate prompt compensation are going to be provided, then that suffices. Then we said that, so why can we say that something is in the public interest? So we look at the constitution and if you look at the interpretation section of the constitution, uh, we came across uh, a provision uh, which explained public interest as something which inures to the benefits of either the whole Ghana or the section of Ghana. Uh, please, uh, apart from me, everybody should meet himself or herself. But if you want to speak, then raise up your hand, okay? Uh, please mute yourself. I should mute everybody. Okay, let me do it that way. I'm going to mute everybody so that if you want to speak, just raise up your hands with that release you. All right. Yeah. Uh, the noise will stop. Just one minute. Let me see. Uh, so meet all. Man, but this one not be allowed to omit. If you want to talk, just put up your hand, then I will allow you to speak. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Aquinas will also talk about what we call like the where, okay, so if the law is not just, the, if the law which is made is not just, that is to say that it doesn't serve the common good. Must we obey it or should we disobey it? Well, Aquinas will say that we should obey unjust law. If our disobedience of unjust law is going to result in greater uh, uh, chaos or greater uh, 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 harm. In other words, if there is a law which we consider, oh, understand some people in the waiting room, sorry. Who are those? Uh, okay, maybe I should just. But I thought. Uh, 
I think in the waiting room, I'm not sure. Let me see. No, nobody, oh. Nobody's in the waiting room. Uh, nobody's in the waiting room to my knowledge, but let me disable if there's any. I have not enabled waiting room. So I think that, uh, uh, please, the person who said uh, that some of you are in the waiting room, is it true that some are still in the waiting room so that we find a solution? Because I don't see anybody in the waiting room. Uh, okay, all right. Yeah, John, okay, that's fine. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, so uh, I was making the point that according to say that if the law is unjust, uh, you are free to disobey it. The only caveat, that is the, the, the but there is that if your disobedience of unjust law is going to bring about bigger problem, then you must obey it. That is all. So, so there's something called civil disobedience, right? Civil disobedience. So I think that, uh, yes, we have the freedom of uh, movement, freedom of demonstration. And I understand uh, from time to time, people ask for people to go on demonstration. Uh, that is fine. Let's say that if we have like a law, or a policy which you think that uh, it doesn't serve like the public uh, interest. You can demonstrate, but if you have the indications that the demonstration, the disobedience is going to result in greater uh, harm, then uh, accountants will uh, tell you that uh, you don't have to, uh, you know, refuse to obey the unjust law. Just obey the unjust law for the greater good, and the greater good is avoiding greater harm. Good, so these are some of the things that uh, uh, we said. But linking this to the constitution, again, uh, we noted that the constitution more or less has incorporated natural law thinking in its own way. And we gave example. Uh, for example, if you talk about the fact that the Constitution has a whole chapter, right? The whole of chapter five, human rights, and then certain uh, uh, values, certain precepts, which are ordinarily natural law, precepts and all that. Uh, that in itself, okay, somebody says to repeat the human law. Okay, all right, so the human law within uh, St. Thomas Aquinas uh, scheme refers to uh, uh, you know, participation, right? Participation of uh, rational beings, that is the uh, human beings in the eternal law. In other words, when uh, human beings, we appropriate, we take, you know, sorry, uh, I said, uh, yeah, we take uh, uh, not the, the uh, eternal law, but the natural law, sorry, I mean, if human beings, if you reduce uh, the natural law into concrete, uh, concrete situations, right, of our existence, then that is the human law. Let me give you an example. For example, the law on murder, okay, criminal law on murder. Criminal law on murder is an attempt to try and incorporate the natural law principle of uh, sanctity of life or and also uh, uh, preservation of life. So there'll be a law which says that it is a capital offense to kill another person intentionally. So that is human law. But this human law is uh, working out uh, an aspect of the natural law. I mean, let's take manslaughter, right? Manslaughter where you've killed someone but there was no intention to kill the person, but maybe as a result of uh, lack of care on your part, resulting in the death of a person. That's, you brought about death of another person, but then the requisite mens rea 
the, the, the state of uh, uh, you know, uh, guilty mind or the guilty state of mind, which is required of you to commit, for example, murder is lacking. So let's say that natural law per se, natural law principle of sanctity of life, for example, will not help us to know the difference between a clear situation of someone having caused death intentionally and where another person's uh, maybe failure to exercise risk, uh, I mean, requisite uh, care has, for example, resulted in death of another person. But uh, human law will help us to, for example, uh, work out uh, the, the situation. And that is why we said that uh, human law may be variable, I mean, va variable that it changes in accordance with time and circumstances in which it is formulated. But in a sense, it should be just. And it, I, I cited the dictum of uh, Sowa JSC in the well known case of Tufo versus Attorney General, where Sowa will make the point that our constitution is like a living organism which mirrors the aspiration and the past of our people, and so on. That is to say that our law is unique to our circumstances. Our man-made law, our positive law, you make law to deal with. Let, let me give you a typical example. There's a talk about Galamsey, right? Uh, illegal mining. And people are calling for uh, a more robust fight. OK. Then the government says that we have increased the sanction, the punishment, which should be meted out to people who are found guilty of uh, illegal mining, Galamsey. Now here, you see that the law is being calibrated. The law is being formulated in order to address a particular problem that we have on our hand. So that is just an example. But if you remember the Imposition of Restrictions Act, when COVID-19 came, if you remember, uh, where parliament passed a law to enable the president to, by means of executive instruments, to impose restrictions which were considered necessary in trying to uh, fight or mitigate the, the horrors of uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Yeah, so uh, the takeaway, uh, my uh, brother who has the Dauda, I mean Dauda, is that the less humana is simply uh, an attempt to provide uh, practical application of natural law to our everyday existence, if you like. I mean, within uh, acquaintances uh, for scheme, uh, that is what we can say. Any other question before we move on to, okay. Uh, there being no further questions, let us uh, look at the uh, Hugo uh, Grotius and uh, his contribution to uh, natural law uh, thinking. I'm sure you've heard of Hugo Grotius. Well, Hugo Grotius is quite uh, famous as having, okay, somebody has another question. Uh, Okay, that, that good, that's fine. Uh, Hugo Grotius is well known for his brilliance. Why do I say that? If you look at the, the, the I mean, literature, we are told that Grotius had is a doctor of laws, LLD, or, or what we call today PhD in law, and in, at an early age of I think, 18 years or so. So by 18 years, or he already had the doctor of laws. It was quite brilliant. Yeah, so Grotius um, uh, was a, 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 a Dutch uh, a scholar, and you've also met him uh, when we were learning international law. I'm sure you've met him already, because Grotius is even uh, said to be the father of modern international law. When he wrote his famous work, Ac Bellum Ac Pacis, Ac Bellum Ac Pacis, that is the law of war and peace. I don't know if you came across that when you were learning public international law. Uh, so uh, uh, Grotius uh, is also associated or credited 
with uh, inaugurating or opening uh, the secular national law thinking. He, uh, don't forget that Aquinas was the, he was about 13th uh, uh, century scholar. So uh, from Aquinas, Christian thinking had been revived as financial law is concerned. At the same time, reason also existed uh, uh, side by side. But groceries will come, and groceries will go. Groceries will make the point that uh, we can actually talk about natural law without uh, thinking or talking about God. Basically, this was a part of the argument that uh, 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 groceries uh, will make, and his ideas influenced so many uh, important uh, scholars, especially the people we call at the social contractarians, right? Those who uh, propounded the social contract theories, including uh, Thomas Hobbes, uh, John Locke, J.J. Rousseau. And uh, these contra, um, social contractarians, uh, the ideas actually also influence the well-known American Revolution, uh, which gave birth to the American democracy, which for many years, uh, more than 200 years, has been, if you like, an example of uh, what constitutional democracy is supposed to be, and then people uh, point to it every now and again. Now, Hugo Grotius, regarded certain things as uh, being intrinsically wrong, whether or not it have been decreed by God. In other words, for him, there are certain matters which by their nature, they are wrong. And it does not matter that you are aware whether God has decreed it or not. In other words, Grotius will argue that whether a thing is right or wrong, is not to be determined by divine fiat, but by its natural appropriateness. That is to say that we don't need to find out whether God has decreed that this should be this or that should be that. But looking at the thing itself, in grocious thinking, we can know whether it is appropriate or not appropriate. So therefore, Hugo Grotius placed so much emphasis on natural reason of man, that as human beings, we can use our reason to determine. Let me, uh, yeah, I'm running a class online. I'll call you back when I finish. So as human beings, we can use our uh, reason to actually uh, assess uh, whether things are good or things are or bad. And that is why Grotius will make the famous statement that natural law will subsist. Subsist means that it will exist, right? Even if God did not exist. Look at how you put it. That is a very uh, sweeping or very uh, radical pronouncement, isn't it? Trying to say that what is good will remain good. What is bad will remain bad. Assuming, in the extreme case, assuming just for sake of argument, that if God did not exist. So that is the point Grotius was trying to make. So it here seems daramus non esse deum. It yamsi daramus non esse deum. Natural law will subsist even if God did not uh, exist. So here, you see, Grotius has actually extricated natural law thinking from uh, uh, matters of faith to our rational uh, thinking, as it were. Of course, uh, if you come back to our own people, we are told that Obin Tre Akolayami, right? Obin Tre Akolayami, that is to say that, uh, of course, Obin Tre Akolayami will literally means that no one points. Uh, a child to God, and everyone uh, knows God without being, uh, 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 no, 
being introduced to everyone knows God. Another sense in which we explain Obinsha Akwalenya I mean, will probably also be that uh, if something is good, everyone has the ability to use the reason to know that it is good. If something is bad, uh, people also have the ability to use their, 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 their reason or mind to say that uh, it's bad. Uh, so that is the point uh, being made. So this will take us quickly to the era of the uh, social uh, contractors. Uh, those scholars who also uh, drew inspiration from uh, some of the ideas uh, which uh, Hugo Grusius, for example, uh, propounded. So we will talk about uh, Thomas Hobbes. Uh, Thomas Hobbes, I'm sure those of you who've done government before might have uh, heard about him. Uh, Thomas Hobbes, uh, is one of those who propounded uh, what they call like, the social uh, contract theory. Now, just before I we say a few more words about Hobbes, if you talk about the social contract theory, we are just uh, talking about uh, those scholars who attempt to explain the authority of the state, the legitimacy of power, which the state exercises over its citizen. In other words, you and I, why should we, for example, obey the laws of Ghana? Why should we uh, pay taxes? Why should you allow the police to be able to arrest us and things like that? You no, know, so they try to explain the basis of legitimacy of the existence of the state, the authority of the state over the citizen. So those are what we call like the social uh, contract theories. Okay, I've seen that uh, Davis has actually told us some of the things he learned, uh, that life was only to poor Nazi and British, okay. Yeah, so uh, having understood generally uh, what these social contract theories are trying to do, let us look at, uh, some of the specific contributors. And one of them is Thomas Hobbes. So uh, he, I mean, he will come from the perspective that man's basic instinct was that of self-preservation. In other words, if you look at man in his original uh, state, right? What do you call it? The state of nature. The state of nature simply means that we assume that we are all in the same situation, how uh, God uh, made us and nobody has built a house, nobody has a car, nobody has put any of these uh, man-made structures in place. And just a second. Yeah, so in that situation uh, where we are there, we have no government, right? No, none of these uh, state institutions or machinery. If you have something and I like it and I can beat you, I'll ask you to give it to me. If you don't give it to me, I beat you and then I take it. Now, if I step on you and then you complain, why have you step on me? I just slap you again. And it's like, uh, typically, if you've heard about the like the might is right. If you were stronger, you could have your way and everybody will do your bidding. And that is why uh, Hobbes will make the point that in the state of nature, uh, there was what they called international warfare. Like we are constantly at war against uh, each other. And for that matter, life was nasty, brutish and short, in the sense that any time, any day, someone can overpower you just because he's stronger than you and he wants to have his way. He wants to get something that you have. And if you resisted, you could even end up being killed and all that. 
and that meant, according to uh, Hobbes, that there was that, uh, if you like, the extreme sense of insecurity. And man was desperate for self-preservation to keep himself safe from uh, some of these uh, uh, destruction that he could not do anything about. And to do that, if you needed to preserve your life from uh, some of these attacks and all that, you need that protection. And how are you going to get the protection? You surrender some of your freedom, right, to a central authority, what you call like the sovereign. And then the sovereign will set in place uh, arrangements or machinery, which will provide protection for you so that those who are stronger than you can no longer bully you or uh, visit violence upon you just because they want to have that way or they want to have that way belongs to you. And because of this, a law and government became necessary, right? So you see how he's trying to explain why we have the state, why we have the government, that we have, like I cannot protect myself against those who are stronger than me. But if I give permission to the state by giving my freedom to the state, so to speak, then the state having that coercive power, having that muzzle, which is far greater than that of an individual, will be able to uh, safeguard me against other people. So every citizen, according to Hobbes, becomes politically obligated to the sovereign. All must obey the sovereign as a prerequisite for justice. So we must obey the state. We must obey the state. And Hobbes will argue that there cannot be an unjust law emanating from the sovereign. And it is only when the sovereign cannot guarantee the preservation of citizen, that obligation to obey the law ceases. Now this is quite pertinent. If you remember, St. Thomas Aquinas told us that where the law is not just, citizen may disobey it so long as disobedience is not going to result in greater uh, chaos or violence. But Thomas Hobbes is saying that so far as we have given our uh, freedom and permission to the sovereign, and the sovereign is ruling us or ruling over us and protecting us, then there is nothing like the sovereign making an unjust law. Now, the only time where we can decide not to obey the sovereign is where the sovereign is unable to guarantee preservation of citizen, right? Like, so let's say that if the state is not able to uh, protect me against attack by other criminals, other lawless people, then I will not feel obliged, I will not feel obligated to obey the laws and institution of the state because the basis for my obedience to the state, to the sovereign, is the uh, 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 provision of protection. And if the state cannot protect me, then I don't have to obey the state as it were. And so that is what uh, Hobbes is telling us. So therefore, Hobbes will characterize peace, which mind desire as a consequence of the need for self-preservation as the first law of nature. So we say that the first law of nature is what? Self-preservation. And self-preservation is also inextricably linked with the idea of peace. If you need to preserve yourself, then you must live in peace. You must live in harmony, isn't it? So that you are protected and I'm also protected. So therefore, the mutual diversity of individual rights to the sovereign 
as the second law of nature. And the third law is the need to respect contracts voluntarily entered into. So if you look at it, uh, Hobbes is trying to give certain uh, basic precepts or basic truths of natural law. Self-preservation, the fact that everyone would like to uh, protect himself against danger. And that means that we are entitled to have peace. And then second one, uh, the fact that we as individuals will have to give our freedom, the freedom that if you like we had in the state of nature, where we are law unto ourselves, so long as we can protect ourselves against others. We give that kind of, you know, that freedom, untrammeled freedom, so to speak, to the sovereign, so that uh, the sovereign will be able to uh, also give us uh, protection. And uh, thirdly, uh, that there's a need to respect contracts. So you hear of Pacta Sun Savanda, isn't it? So the social contractarians also believe in Pacta Sun Savanda, that contracts or agreements are sacred and they are to be obeyed. So uh, according to Thomas Hobbes, once you've made contract, that should be uh, uh, respected. So long as it was voluntarily entered into. Voluntarily entered into that to say that no one wears you or no one visited if you are what we may call a visiting factors upon you to enter into it, then you must obey it. And all these are uh, in Hobbesian thinking uh, constitute morality, which is arrived at through the social contract. So the so social contract you're talking about is nothing more than the fact that we as individuals, because we need to protect our lives against those who are stronger than us, we need peace and we cannot guarantee it. So we give the unlimited freedom that we had in the state of nature to the, the state, like the sovereign, so that the sovereign will protect us. And because we have done this arrangement in complete uh, you know, freedom, we've done it uh, from our own volition, free will, then we must respect it, we must obey it. And that is why we call it a social uh, contract, uh, so to speak. Then we also have uh, another social contractarian called uh, uh, John Locke. Uh, John Locke, I also call, I, I mean, focus on the concept of what they call it, the natural uh, rights. Uh, that is uh, what rights and duties men have as creatures of God in a state of nature. So the state of nature here again, we are talking about the situation is an, of course, don't ask me, how was the state of nature? It's an imaginary thing. So it's, it's, a, it's just an imaginary situation to try and explain the concept of the modern state, if you like. So, uh, in the state of nature, uh, Locke will say that we human beings as creatures of God are entitled to certain rights and duties. Now, quite different from Thomas Hobbes, John Locke will base his uh, social contract theory on the premise of ownership of property, right? Acquired by missing labor with free gifts of it, what God has given to all. In other words, John Locke says that the world which is created out there is there for all of us, okay? And if you as an individual, you have exerted yourself in order to appropriate part of the created world, Maybe by you did farming or you put up a house or like you did something which came about as a result of you applying your energy, right? Your sweat. Then once you have done that, according to John Locke, you acquire property against all other human beings. And what you have acquired should be respected and protected. But maybe 
those of us who are students of land law or property law, probably we could draw some sort of analogy with this uh, idea in customary land law. Customary land law, remember the usufactual interest or customary freehold, uh, where we are told that uh, if you are a member of the Alodia uh, family or the Alodia to the I mean the family having the Alodia title, uh, you can uh, cultivate portion of the land in which the Alodia is held uh, up to whichever uh, uh, points that your machete, your cutlass can actually enable you to weed up to. And once you have done that, then that's why the fact that that land in which the Lodia title, for example, is held, ordinarily belongs to the entire family or the Sioux and the subjects of it. Because you have uh, applied your labor, right, your sweat, to appropriate or cultivate uh, some of that stretch of land, the law, a customer law, recognizes that you have a superior interest or ownership in that over and above uh, all other subjects, except if you like the Alodia title itself. I think it's a very similar idea what John Locke is talking about that so long as you as a person, you have sweated to apply your own labor to that which exists in nature, then whatever results out of that should be recognized as your property, right? Should be recognized as your property. And according to Locke, this idea of how property is acquired or how ownership is constructed is a prime value of all morality. Therefore, Locke will argue that uh, the state of nature was one of pure bliss, but it suffered inadequacy. That is to say that before we came to have the modern state in the lost thinking, things were good, if you like. However, there was one major deficiency, one major thing lacking. That thing which was lacking was that there was insecurity of property. That is to say that when you have worked so hard to acquire a property, uh, you could not be sure that you and you alone can lay claim to it as it were. And for that matter, there was a need for an arrangement which will ensure that the property that you have acquired by your own sweat and exertions will, for example, be safeguarded against other people making unlawful claim to it. And those arrangements which would enable that to be done according to law uh, is uh, uh, what they call like the law and government. So therefore, law and government or the state exist to secure natural rights of the individual. And foremost or uh, among uh, these natural rights is a right to hold other men responsible for breaches of the natural rights of others. So you have uh, your property, for example, someone decide to dishonestly appropriate it. What do you call stealing? You're entitled to be protected against that. So therefore, the fact that we have like the fence of Celia and all that ensures that your property is what safeguarded against those that you've not decided to transfer to or permit to use it as it were. So Locke will argue further that the citizen must obey both law and government. So long as it is capable of preserving its natural rights by holding others responsible for such breaches. In other words, so long as the law and the state are able to ensure that 
your natural rights, including your property, right, can be safeguarded against others, then you must obey the state. However, if it gets to a state where the state is unable to, for example, protect your natural rights, then you don't have obligation to obey the state. You see that uh, a bit similar, but a different perspective from uh, Hobbes. So Hobbes is talking about uh, protection uh, generally, that the state should be able to protect you against uh, others, right? Uh, so that the self-preservation that you desire can be attained. Now Locke is looking at it more from property perspective, that your property should be protected by the state. And if the state is not able to protect that, then you don't have to obey uh, the state as it were. We have another social contractarian called J.J. Uh, Rousseau, or Jane Jack uh, Rousseau. Uh, Rousseau's version of social contract theory emphasized the concept of the general will the general will. In other words, uh, the social contract, by, I mean, through the lenses of uh, Rousseau, was the way by which the individual merges into the life of the community and becomes part of the general will. What do you mean by this? That is to say that you as individual you have just one will, okay? If you take the, the state, and for that matter, like the sovereign, it is an aggregation that is collection of different, 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 different people and their will, right? And that is certainly superior to uh, that of the individual. So therefore, you as individual, you merge into the life of the community. So law and government become the register, if you like, of the general will. So law and government is supposed to reflect, or is supposed to be an embodiment of what you call like, the general will. So that if you take the laws of Ghana, for example, the laws of Ghana are supposed to be seen as, I mean, if you are using uh, J.J. Rousseau's uh, 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 taxonomy or language, are supposed to be seen as a reflection of the general will of what of Ghana. And that is why we should obey it. And for that matter, you don't choose, you, you don't pick and choose which one you want to obey. You don't say that's for me, I belong to this religion, I belong to this. And for that matter, uh, when the national anthem is being sung, I will do whatever I like. Or uh, I don't respect any symbol as being a reflection of the state and all that. No, uh, that is the general will. And so long as uh, by the social contract, you are integrated and incorporated into the general will, you must uh, respect that. So to J.J. Rousseau then, the general will, which is characterized by the popular sovereignty, is what determines what is good for society as a whole. And this replaces the higher, the higher law standard which natural law represents. In other words, Rousseau is trying to mitigate the abstraction, right? Abstraction or the metaphysical aspect of natural law. You know, natural law, we say that those higher principles out there and so on. Now, that is so much of like an, an abstract, isn't it? so much of like a metaphysics. And he would rather say that, why not you know, look at it from the point of view of uh, the general will? That is what the society as a whole, for example, reflects. And that is, uh, that would determine what is good for society. So therefore in Ghana, if you want to know what is good for society, we need to find out, is it in the public interest? In public interest, the constitution has made us aware 
refers to that which inures to the benefit of the whole of the population of Ghana or a segment of it. If the answer is yes, then that is the public uh, interest or the, the general will, as it were. Well, we also have another uh, German uh, uh, scholar uh, called Rudolf uh, Stamler, uh, who also made uh, some uh, contribution uh, to the natural law uh, thinking. Uh, Stamler was a German uh, jurist and and don't forget that Germany has produced a lot of uh, uh, great uh, philosophers. Very uh, In the course of this course, we talk about uh, Hegel. I'm sure some of you have heard about Hegel. And uh, these are uh, great uh, uh, scholars. So Stamler was a German uh, jurist, and he was concerned with the formulation of the right law based on justice. In other words, how can we formulate uh, the right law in order to, uh, yeah, somebody said Rousseau is not clear to me. Uh, what aspect can you explain? So that, which, which aspect, uh, Dauda? Dauda, okay, let me release you. Uh, Dauda, you can mute yourself. Yeah. Yes, please go ahead. Say so when you the 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 last aspect you came and you were explaining, I didn't get it properly. Uh, which one? Can you uh, see it so that? Yeah, can you scroll back to the news so that I will? Oh, okay. Uh, okay. That is that is uh, the place that you said. He says that you uh, all human beings in the society become part of the general world, and you are bound to obey. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. So, uh, what Rousseau is saying is that uh, for him the legitimacy, that is to say that as to whether the, the state, and for that matter, like the, you know, the sovereign, has the power to rule over us, to make laws and all that, is based upon the general will, which it reflects. And what is that? That is to say that once we have accepted to become part of the state, our individual wills have uh, met or have become part. And for that matter, if you are looking at things, we don't look at it from our par uh, uh, parochial uh, interests, but we must look at it from the interests of the society as well. Let me give you this example. Let's suppose that uh you may for example want a sit arrangement where work will start at nine okay instead of eight if you go to uk oh my line is going off 